morning and welcome to our online service for Abbeywood Community Church. We're so glad that you're able to join with us today. And, you know, at the same time, maybe as you're watching this, we're actually having our in-person services at Lessness Abbey. If you're not quite ready for that, we totally understand, and which is why we want to keep providing this for you. Um, as we start today, we're going to be continuing our series in in the Bible that's called Real, you know, looking at actual people and their authentic faith. And today we're going to be looking at Caleb. And, and as I was reading the story of Caleb this week and kind of going through things, it made me kind of think through all the things that I'm thankful for with, with the Lord. And the song 10,000 Reasons came to mind. The truth is, I can't come up with a number as to how thankful I am for him especially in different situations that come up. So as we begin today, let's sing this together, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his whole. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. i 
Now we're going to have our kids talk with Helena, and we're going to continue through God's plan. Last week we saw how, how Moses and the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. And now let's see where Moses and the children of Israel are now. So let's hear from Helena. Put your hands up if you like going on journeys. Well, if I'm honest, I don't really like going on journeys. I get bored. I just want to get there. So to keep myself occupied, I like to pack a few things. I like to have a drink. Now, of course, I've got to have a few snacks for the journey. Throw in a healthy one as well. And then a book. It's nice to have a good book to read while you're travelling. But to be honest, when I'm travelling, all I want to do is arrive at my destination. Well, the Israelites had a destination, and that was the promised land. Last week we heard how God had rescued them from Egypt. He had done amazing things and he had opened up the Red Sea and all the Israelites crossed safely following Moses and they reached the other side. But to get to the promised land, the Israelites had to travel through the wilderness, which was like a desert, very, very harsh land where there wasn't a lot of food and water. But the problem with the Israelites is that they soon forgot how great God was and they soon forgot all the great things that God had done for them in rescuing them and they started to moan and moan and grumble and complain. Now their journey was not just a few hours long, in fact it wasn't just a few days long. In the end the journey that the Israelites went on took 40 years. Can you imagine going on a journey for 40 years and they were camping sleeping in tents. Now that's a long journey. Their journey was so long because they didn't trust God to look after them. So let's see what happened on that journey. Moses led the people away from the Red Sea and they came to the wilderness. They could not find good water to drink and they complained to Moses. God said, if you obey me, and do what is right and keep my commands. I will not punish you like I punished the Egyptians. I am Yahweh who heals you. The Israelites came to a place called Elam where they found plenty of food and water. They camped there. The Israelites left Elam and journeyed into the wilderness. They were hungry. They complained to Moses. We wish we had died in Egypt. At least there was food to eat, they said. You brought us out here to starve to death. But Moses had not brought them out there to die. God knew what he was doing. God said, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, in the evening you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you are full. Then you will know that I am Yahweh your God. So at evening, quail came into the camp. In the morning, fine flakes like frost were on the ground. What is it? The Israelites asked. Moses said, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. The Israelites called the bread manna, which means, What is it? God gave the people instructions. He told them to collect just enough to eat for the day. If they collected too much, the leftovers went bad. He told them to collect twice as much on the sixth day, because the seventh day was the Sabbath, a day to rest. The Israelites did not always follow God's instructions. Sometimes they collected too much manna, and sometimes they tried to collect manna on the Sabbath day. Moses was angry that the people refused to obey God. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years while they were in the wilderness. The Israelites moved about the wilderness as the Lord told them to do. One day, they came to a camp with no water. Give us something to drink, they told Moses. Why are you complaining to me? Moses asked. You brought us out here to die, the Israelites said. They forgot that the Lord had a plan for them. Lord, what should I do? Moses cried out. God showed Moses a rock and instructed him to hit it with his staff. Water came out of it and the people drank. It was a sign that the Lord was with them. In the New Testament, Jesus said that he is the bread of life. 
God provided manna from heaven for his people's physical hunger. And later, he provided his son Jesus for our spiritual hunger. The Israelites needed bread to live for a little while, but whoever has Jesus will live forever. God's plan is to rescue his people. And God did rescue his people, didn't he? He rescued them from slavery in Egypt, but he also rescued them from certain death in the wilderness because he provided food and water. He provided for their physical needs, the things they needed to survive. But God provides more than that. He rescues us from more than physical problems because the Bible says that God rescues us from sin. Jesus is our rescuer. When we put our trust in Jesus, when we believe in him, he becomes our rescuer because he died on the cross for us. He's paid the punishment that we deserve and he rescues us so that we can become children of God. If you're going on a journey this week, remember the Israelites and their journey in the wilderness and remember how God provided for them, but that he also provides for us as well. He provided us a way to heaven, a new life, and that was through his son, Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer now together. Lord, we just thank you that you are in control. Lord, we thank you that in the midst of all of this chaos that we've seen in, in our world over the last year and a half, and Lord, we know there's still some parts of the world where there is still even more chaos happening. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are in control. Lord, we may not understand all the plans. We may not understand um, why things happen sometimes. But Lord, we know that you are sovereign and that you, you do know. You see the whole plan as we only see small parts. Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters in India right now that the whole country is being ravaged by, by this disease of COVID. Lord, and I just pray that you would... Be with those pastors and churches that are serving and loving their community. Lord, for, for the churches that have actually opened up their buildings to be makeshift hospitals. Lord, we pray that you would protect them, provide for them. Lord, we pray that you would use these situations so that people can come to know you. Lord, I pray, Lord, for here in our country as, as people are wanting to see things open up more. Lord, we pray that you would give our government wisdom. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we act, uh, interact with people and, and try to serve and love and care for them. Lord, I pray for, for the people that have let us use the Lessons Lodge there at Lessons Savvy. I pray that they would be able to see who you are through us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities uh, that we're seeing opened up in, in our community. As Seanette had shared with us about the different uh, little fairs that they're going to be having and, and having a stall. We just pray that, Lord, you would open those doors, Lord, that we would have a chance to serve our community, Lord, and proclaim your word. Lord, we thank you once again for just giving us the technology to be able to do these services online as well as being able to meet in person. Lord, we just pray that as we look at the story of Caleb today, that we would see what we need to learn and take away from it. In Jesus' name, amen. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty That all the earth rejoice Joys. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God.
and age to age you stand And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The God hath deep and one Father, Spirit, Son Our scripture reading today is going to be in Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 17. And we're going to go all the way to chapter 14, verse 9. And just to give some context, this is right after Moses has chosen the 12 spies that are going to go into the promised land and, and check out the land for them. And then it says this, starting in verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev. And into the hill country, see what the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin, as far as Rehab, toward Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkel because of the cluster of grapes that the Israelites cut off there. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. 
The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And then he said to, uh, and then they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of um, Jephunneh who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land and a land flowing with milk and honey and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at our series, Real, Actual People of Authentic Faith. And we're, and we're looking at some of the people that they would, they would not be the main one, but we can still learn so much from them. And, and this week, we're taking a look at Caleb. Now, the first time we hear Caleb's name is, is when the, the children of Israel are on the edge of the promised land, and they're wanting to send people in to kind of spy out the land, see what's going on. And he is one of the 12 that are chosen. And, and as they go through, these 12 men are all looking at the same thing. These 12 men are seeing the same sights. They're, they're seeing these, these fruits. They're seeing the, the abundance of the land. But for some reason, when they come out, there's two very different views. You know, they come and they, and they report to Moses and the people. And, and 10 of them basically say, you know what, the land is is good but there's these giants there's these people that will just destroy us there are these the, the land will basically consume us we're like grasshoppers to these people that's how small we are compared to them and then you have this contrasting view and when we when we see Caleb's response he he looks at things a very very different way we see in verse 30, it said, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. And then immediately, the other 10 guys are sitting there going, But the, the men who had gone up with him and said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. See, here we, we get the first glimpse into the focus of the two groups. You have Caleb and Joshua who are looking at it, and they are looking at the land through the promise that God had given them. And these other men are looking at it from a completely human standpoint going, we can't do this. And Caleb and Joshua are going, you're right. We can't do it without God. But God's in our corner. God's behind us. So we can do anything. At the end of that, that reading that we, we just looked at, it said, if the, in verse 8 in chapter 14, it says, If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And so these two parts in, in chapter 13 and chapter 14 really give us an insight into 
who Caleb is. You know, as I was studying this week, you, you see four or five different uh, times where, where it's talking about Caleb. In Joshua 14, 14, um, it says, So Hebron had belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. And that was describing where where uh, Caleb would receive the land. And in Numbers 14, 24, a little bit on from what we had read, it says, but be, this is the Lord talking. He says, but because my servant Caleb had a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. See, because of this rebellion that we see with the children of Israel, I mean, they, even, I mean, they go as far as say, hey, let's pick a leader. Let's go back to slavery. How mental is that? They're saying, hey, we were better off in slavery than this land that God has promised us. Now, mind you, the children of Israel have seen the biggest empire in the world brought to its knees through the plagues. They've seen God deliver them through the Red Sea and the parting of the Red Sea and walking through on dry ground. They've seen God provide for them manna and 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 quail so they had meat and they have this type of bread and and all these things everything along the way they have seen god provide and do miracles they have seen him completely protect them so why does their faith waver now and this is where we see this distinction notice the the two joshua 14 14 and numbers 14 24 both of them say the same thing about Caleb. Then again, in Numbers 32 and in Deuteronomy 1 and Joshua chapter 14, it all says the same phrase. Because Caleb followed God wholeheartedly. Everything about Caleb and the way he looked at the things, God was in the equation. When, when he looked at the land, he said, you know what? Yes, there's a lot of of peoples here that, that God has given into our hands, we can take the land because God is with us and promised to be with us and deliver them into our hands. Doesn't matter what the opposition is. Doesn't matter what the circumstance is. Cato looked at it like this. If God is in the equation, everything will work out. Now, does that mean everything was going to be easy? The last two years in the wilderness hadn't been easy, but God had provided, God had protected, God had saved them on countless times. And, and, and so we see this heart of complete trust from Caleb. Caleb trusts in the Lord. Caleb wants to follow what the Lord has said. You know, so many times situations come up and, and the first thing that we do is, how can I fix this? How can I solve this? All of us have done it. You would think that we would have learned a long time ago to, to go to God as the first response and not the last resort. But yet time and time again, we do that. Now, in this account that where we, we see Caleb and Joshua, they, they follow God and they're able to see the results immediately. Because the punishment for the people, God says, you know what, I, I think I'm going to just destroy them, Moses, and we'll just start over. And Moses says, but what, what will the nations think of that? So he said, fine. Basically, anybody 20 years old or over will die as they wander around the wilderness. You won't enter this land right now. You will wander around the wilderness, and those people who did not trust me, those people who did not follow me, will lie there in the wilderness dead except Caleb and Joshua, because they have followed me wholeheartedly. They have trusted in me. And then later on, as we get into the promised land and, and you see uh, Joshua begin to divide up the lands according to what God has said, when it comes to the land that, um, that Caleb is given, he is given the land that that they were, most people were the most afraid of because they said, you know, the, these are the descendants of of the, the, the Nephilim, these are the, the, the giant people. The, these guys were huge. 
Later on, we, we hear of another descendant, and that's Goliath. When we hear of David and Goliath, he was a giant of a man. I mean, you're talking nine feet tall. These guys are big, and he's going, they're nothing compared to God. I'm not worried about them. God said he would give me this. Therefore, I will be able to conquer the land as God has said, and my family will live here. It's such a cool thing to see that absolute trust, regardless of the circumstances. The cool thing is we see God reward his faith in a couple ways. Not only did he, was he able to enter the promised land, but when, when it comes to the time where he's going to take the land that he has given, he says, you know, I feel the same as I did 40 years ago when we had spied out the land. He's now 85 years old. And yet he's saying, I feel, I feel just as strong as I did before. God rewarded him with the strength to then conquer and enjoy what he had been promised because he had trusted in God completely. Now, understand this. These, these lands that they were conquering, these weren't just like easy little things. These were walled cities. You're talking about these walls that, that are, are, are surrounding as like towers and different things. 15 meters wide in some cases, and, and you have the, these walls like in Jericho that are big enough for a chariot to be able to turn around at the top of the wall. And Joshua and Caleb go, God can deliver it. God has promised it. I will follow him. See, so many times we think, you know, if I was just able to see these things, it would probably increase my faith. It would probably make it easier to trust in God in those hard situations. But here's the thing. Joshua and Caleb were dealing with what they were seeing and, and what they knew about God. We're able to look at all of Scripture and see all the different ways that God has been faithful from start to finish. The provision of his son Jesus as the atoning sacrifice on the cross. We're able to see how he uses regular men, his, his 12 disciples, to then go out and proclaim his word and change the course of history forever. We're able to see how, how these leaders would serve and would follow God wholeheartedly. We have all of scripture to look at. No, it's not happening right in front of us, but we have all the evidence we need in God's word. So here's, here's my question. Are we following God wholeheartedly? Many of us have, have trusted in God to be our salvation. We have asked Jesus into our hearts and accepted him as our savior. So we trust him to save us. But do we trust him to sustain us? Do we trust him to free us from those sins that we have struggled with for so long? Do we believe that he can free us up from the sins that we've got, gotten stuck into? Do we trust that when he says, I will give you life and give it to you more abundantly for us to have joy to the full? Do we trust that he can deliver on those things? When circumstances are hard, when life is, is not the easiest at the moment, do we still trust in him as much as we do when things are going great? It was interesting. I was talking with our, our young people and I said, why, why is it that it seems so hard to stay consistent in our prayer life when things are going good? And they're like, well, because you forget you get focused on the good stuff, and so you kind of forget that he's the one that provided it. It's easy for us to remember him when things are going bad. Because we cry out, Lord, help me. Please just help me. But we're on, when we're on that mountaintop, are we still going, Lord, just continue to work in me. Continue to, to work in my heart. Work out that, that process of sanctification that we all need as the Holy Spirit's working on us to make us more Christ-like. For us to love and serve people the way we're supposed to. Are we loving and serving people regardless of the circumstances? Are we living out God's word day to day regardless of the circumstances? 
Are we following God wholeheartedly, 110%, whether it's good or bad? Now, do we, do we sit there and say, Lord, you know what? The circumstances are hard right now, but I love you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what's right regardless. The world says we should be doing something else. The world's saying, you know what? You pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You, you do it because you can do it. God's saying, do you trust me to do more than you can imagine? Do you trust me to get you through those circumstances in those times? Do you trust me to, to provide, to sustain, to free you up from those things that have, have pulled you down? Do you, do you trust me to deal with every situation, even when you don't see any way out of it? See, he wants us to trust, at the, uh, us to trust him at the beginning of these situations, before we get into it. We have to make that choice in our heart like like we see with Caleb. Caleb said, I'm going to follow God wholeheartedly. Are we going to allow God to work completely in us? Are we going to trust him not only to save us, but to sustain, to free, to provide, to deal with the situations that we don't see any way out of, but we're going to trust that he is going to show us the way. See, if, if we look at Caleb's life, we realize in every equation of his life, God was involved. God was at the forefront. He looked at God and then looked at everything else. It's kind of like now if you, if you put a filter on a camera, or now you can do it digitally and you put a filter on, it changes the whole look and perspective of what you're seeing on the screen or in the photo or whatever. And so for Caleb, what he did was he looked at God first and then looked at the situations. He looked at God first and then looked at the obstacles. He looked at God first and then said, okay, all this is possible because God is involved. Now, you may sit there and say, well, you, you, don't, you don't know what I'm dealing with right now. You're right. I don't know what you're dealing with right now. You may sit there and say, you know, you don't understand the circumstances of my life. You're right. I don't understand the circumstances of your life. You may sit there and say, you know, you don't understand this, this addiction that I have or this, this scar that I have from, from my experiences. You're right. I don't understand any of it. But God does. The question is, are we going to allow God to be part of every equation in our life? Or are we going to allow God to work in us and through us to sustain, to free, to provide, to, to walk with day by day as he builds us up and works continually in our lives? Are we going to allow him to do that? Tony Evans says this in his commentary. He says, Caleb's story reminds us that even when people around us make problems sound bigger than God, we don't have to succumb to popular opinion. We can take God at his word. Of course, this doesn't mean you should ignore problems. That may, they may be significant, but no matter what you face, you can take courage in the knowledge that God is sovereign over your problems and those of your peers. Caleb walked faithfully with God, and God remembered him. He can do the same for you as you choose to be influenced, not by those who say God can't make a way, but by the knowledge that there is nothing too big for him. What a perfect kind of summation of, of what we see in Caleb's life. It's, it's so important for us to look and learn from the experiences of others. When we look at Caleb, it's, it's important to remember he, he was an actual person. He lived what it says in the scriptures. He dealt with these situations in real life. This isn't some um, screenplay thing or something like that or a script from a television show. This is history that we're looking at here. 
And if God worked in, in those lives, why can't he do the same in ours? So here's the thing. Are we going to allow God to do this in our lives or not? It's a decision that we all have to make and that we need to look at day by day. Every morning when we wake up, we have to make that decision. Lord, work in me. I want to follow you wholeheartedly. I want to love you wholeheartedly. I want you to work in my life. And let us see what God can do in every situation. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. finish up today we hope you've been encouraged by the songs by the scripture that we've read and by the talk about Caleb you know hopefully next week you'll be able to, to join us in person uh, if you ever want to do that go to our website abbeywoodcc.org and you will be able to see our links there to our 10:30 service and our 11:45 service 
Just click on that, you can enter your details and that'll let us know that you're coming. Um, also, if you need to get in touch with us, maybe you haven't met us before in person, you wanna talk to us before you come, feel free to email us at info at abbeywoodcc.org. We look forward to seeing you.